preparation for a christian life section three by soren kierkegaard eighteen thirteen to eighteen fifty five published in eighteen fifty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest come hither for he supposes that they that labor and are heavy laden feel their burden and their labor and that they stand there now perplexed and sighing one casting about with his eyes to discover whether there is help in sight anywhere another with his eyes fixed on the ground because he can see no consolation and a third with his eyes staring heavenward as though help was bound to come from heaven but all seeking therefore he saith come hither but he invites not him who has ceased to seek and to sorrow come hither for he who invites knows that it is a mark of true suffering if one walks alone and broods in silent disconsolateness without courage to confide in any one and with even less confidence to dare to hope for help alas not only he whom we read about was possessed of a dumb devil no suffering which does not first of all render the sufferer dumb is of much significance no more than the love which does not render one silent for those sufferers who run on about their afflictions neither labor nor are heavy laden behold therefore the inviter will not wait till they that labor and are heavy laden come to him but calls them lovingly for all his willingness to help might perhaps be of no avail if he did not say these words and thereby take the first step for in the call of these words come hither unto me he comes himself to them ah human compassion sometimes perhaps it is indeed praiseworthy self-restraint sometimes perhaps even true compassion which may cause you to refrain from questioning him whom you suppose to be brooding over a hidden affliction but also how often indeed is this compassion but worldly wisdom which does not care to know too much ah human compassion how often was it not pure curiosity and not compassion which prompted you to venture into the secret of one afflicted and how burdensome it was almost like a punishment of your curiosity when he accepted your invitation and came to you but he who saith these redeeming words come hither he is not deceiving himself in saying these words nor will he deceive you when you come to him in order to find rest by throwing your burden on him he follows the promptings of his heart in saying these words and his heart follows his words if you then follow these words they will follow you back again to his heart this follows as a matter of course ah will you not follow the invitation come hither for he supposes that they that labor and are heavy laden are so worn out and overtaxed and so near swooning that they have forgotten as though in a stupor that there is such a thing as consolation alas or he knows for sure that there is no consolation and no help unless it is sought from him and therefore must he call out to them come hither come hither for is it not so that every society has some symbol or token which is worn by those who belong to it when a young girl is adorned in a certain manner one knows that she is going to the dance come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden come hither you need not carry an external and visible badge come but with your head anointed and your face washed if only you labor in your heart and are heavy laden come hither ah do not stand still and consider nay consider consider that with every moment you stand still after having heard the invitation you will hear the call more faintly 
and thus withdraw from it even though you are standing still come hither ah uh, however weary and faint you be from work or from the long long and yet hitherto fruitless search for help and salvation and even though you may feel as if you could not take one more step and not wait one more moment without dropping to the ground ah uh, but this one step and here is rest come hither but if alas there be one who is so wretched that he cannot come ah a sigh is sufficient your mere sighing for him is also to come hither end of preparation for a christian life three by soren kierkegaard published in eighteen fifty the sailings of southern illinois by george w smith from the transactions of the illinois state historical society 1904 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the evidence that salt was made within the limits of the present state of illinois by other people than indians and europeans would not be regarded as very trustworthy before a court of the common people but to the man who is accustomed to look into the things about him in a scientific way there is abundant evidence that salt was manufactured in southern illinois by a people whose history antedates that of the tribes who inhabited this country at the coming of the europeans the evidence of prehistoric salt making in the southern part of this state rests very largely upon the fact that in the region of salt springs and salt licks a species of pottery is found whose use can be explained on no other theory so well as on the one which assumes that the vessels were employed in the manufacture of salt on the saline river which flows towards the east and southeast through the counties of williamson saline and gallatin there are two very noted localities they are about four miles apart one locality is noted for a very strong salt spring a strong sulphur spring and a freshwater spring this locality has several names but it is usually called the nigger spring the nigger well and the nigger furnace it is four miles down the river from the present town of equality the other locality is marked by what in early times was called the half moon lick and also by very strong deep wells this point is about one mile from the town of equality and very near the saline river the earliest known english people to settle in this locality came about eighteen hundred or possibly in eighteen o two in the region of the nigger spring and in that of the half moon lick the earliest english settlers found large quantities of all sorts of pottery tomahawks arrowheads vases and other similar articles in addition to these familiar articles there was found a species of pottery unlike that found in other localities these pieces of pottery seemed to be parts of large vessels a sketch of illinois published in philadelphia in eighteen thirty seven contains a short account of Gallatin County. The Nigger Spring is called the Great Salt Spring. This sketch says, the principal spring was formerly possessed by the Indians, who valued it very highly, and it appears probable that they had long been acquainted with the method of making salt. Large fragments of earthenware are continually found near the works, both on and under the surface of the earth they have on them the impression of basket or wicker work mr george e sellers 
a very noted man of gallatin county in an article in the september issue of the popular science monthly for eighteen seventy seven attempts to disprove the current belief that the markings on this pottery were made by a basket or framework in which the vessel is supposed to have been molded his theory is that the impressions were made by wrapping coarse cloth around the vessels as they were lifted off the mold which was within the vessel mr sellers quotes from a number of scientific writers who seem to have either visited the region around the great salt spring or else had specimens of pottery from that locality all the gentlemen who have examined this peculiar pottery are of the opinion that the vessels were used in the manufacture of salt mr sellers first visited the place as early as eighteen fifty four and he says at that time that all about the salt springs there was an abundance of this pottery just above the springs on a ridge which was in cultivation as early as eighteen fifty four mr sellers found acres actually covered with the old salt pans he thinks the people whoever they were were accustomed to take the water upon the hill and there in the pans let the water evaporate possibly the process was hastened by dropping into the pans large stones previously heated in a fire again all around the half moon lick which is near the town of equality large quantities of the same kind of pottery has been found in the report of the illinois board world's fair commissioners eighteen ninety three page two eighty three professor william mcadams says these salt pans have been found in abundance both in and around the salt works in illinois and in missouri near st genevieve he describes them all as having those peculiar markings to which i have referred mr mcadams found two of these pans entire near the salt works at st genevieve missouri they were serving as a coffin it seemed the corpse was put into one of these pans and another pan inverted over the first one and then some earth thrown over the casket professor mcadams says these salt pans are from three to five feet in diameter there are traditions that the salt springs wells and licks on the saline river in gallatin county were operated by the indians and french for many years previous to the coming of the english about eighteen hundred certain it is that the french understood the salt making process the indians without doubt knew where the springs and licks were an english gentleman writing to the earl of hillsborough in 1770 in speaking of the region around the mouth of the wabash and the saline rivers mentioned the abundance of salt springs in that region captain thomas hutchins in a book called topographical description of virginia in describing the region of the wabash says the wabash abounds with salt springs and any quantity of salt may be made from them in a manner now done in the illinois country this was in seventeen seventy eight twenty two years before the coming of any english people mr charles carroll of shawnee town told me it had always been his understanding that the french operated the wells and springs several years previous to eighteen hundred a history of illinois said to have been written by calvin leonard and published by ivison blakeman taylor and company about eighteen seventy has an account of salt making by the french and of a massacre of them by the shawnee indians the chicago historical society knows nothing of such a book and i have doubts of its existence count volney who made a tour of north america from seventeen ninety five to seventeen ninety eight spent considerable time in vincennes in seventeen ninety eight 
and speaks of the brine springs at st genevieve missouri but says not a word about the springs on the saline river mr william mcavoy now of equality says that general leonard white knew volney very well and says that general white told him mcavoy that volney stayed a month in the neighborhood of the salt works i pressed mr mcavoy very closely and he still insisted that general leonard white had often told him of volney's visit to the locality but i could not find a single word about the salt works on the saline in volney's writings so i am inclined to think there is some error in mr mcavoy's tradition the earliest reference i was able to find in the american state papers is in the law of may eighteenth seventeen ninety six in an act of this date it is made the duty of the surveyors working for the united states and making surveys in the territory northwest of the ohio river to observe closely for mines salt springs and salt licks and mill seats evidently there were no wells or springs operated in ohio this early for in the life of ephraim cutler son of rev manassa cutler he says that in seventeen ninety six when he came to the settlements below marietta that there was no salt to be had west of the mountains except at marietta and what was for sale here had been brought over the mountains on pack horses he says further that this salt was sold for sixteen cents per pound mr cutler further says that in seventeen ninety eight the shawnee indians told lieutenant george irving that fifty miles inland from the ohio river there was a salt spring search was made and the spring found near what is now the town of chandlersville ten miles southeast of zanesville a salt company was organized by four settlements and men sent to make salt four men could make six bushels a week by hard work in the winter of seventeen ninety nine and eighteen hundred william henry harrison was the delegate in congress from the territory of the northwest in his report mr harrison says upon inquiry we find that salt springs and salt licks on the east of the muskegon and near the great miami are operated by individuals and timber is being wasted therefore we recommend that salt springs and salt licks property of the united states in the territory northwest of the ohio ought to be leased for a term of years the report was referred to the committee of the whole but no definite action was taken on the committee's recommendation harrison became governor of the indiana territory in the summer of eighteen hundred in eighteen o two he visited kaskaskia and was there importuned to call a convention to take steps looking toward the introduction of slavery into the northwest territory the convention was called in the fall of eighteen o two among other things the convention asked congress to annul the sixth article of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven and to grant saline below the mouth of the wabash to the territory congress received the memorial and granted neither of the two requests on march third eighteen o three congress authorized the secretary of the treasury to lease the salt springs and licks for the benefit of the government on june seventh of the same year harrison negotiated a treaty at fort wayne between the government and five indian tribes this treaty ceded to the united states two million thirty eight thousand four hundred acres of lands in what is now southern indiana and illinois in the same summer of eighteen o three governor harrison leased the saline on the saline river to a captain bell of lexington kentucky i am inclined to think that probably this captain bell 
was at that time working the salt springs on saline river by permission of the indians reynolds says the first white man to settle in shawnee town was a michael sprinkle who came about 1802 and about the same time a frenchman la bossiere settled there and ran a ferry to accommodate people who were coming out of kentucky to the salt works on the saline river captain bell no doubt worked the salt springs till the end of 1806 for the records show that for the year 1807 the works were leased to john bates of jefferson county kentucky by act of congress march 26, 1804 there were established three land offices one at kaskaskia one at detroit and one at vicennes and by the same act all salt springs wells and licks with the necessary land adjacent thereto were reserved from sale as the property of the united states the territorial governor was authorized to lease these salt wells and springs to the best advantage of the government on the thirtieth of april eighteen o five governor harrison appointed his friend isaac white then of vicennes to be government agent to reside at the salt works and to receive the rental due the united states mr white assumed the duties of his position and was assisted by john marshall who probably lived in shawnee town just where white resided is not known but presumably at what i have designated as the nigger well some four miles below equality in eighteen o six september eighth governor harrison appointed mr white a captain in the knox county militia from evidence of a private nature white himself became leasee of the salt works in eighteen o eight and perhaps retained control of them till eighteen ten or eighteen eleven while captain white was residing at the salt works he became involved in a difficulty with a captain butler and butler challenged white to mortal combat the challenge was accepted and two days before the day set for the duel captain white wrote his wife who perhaps was at vincennes a very touching letter telling her he expected to be killed on the same day that he wrote his wife he made his will signed and sealed it on the day set for the duel butler and white both appeared on the appointed spot and they were informed by their seconds that horse pistols were the weapons distance six feet butler backed down and refused to fight saying that it would be murder and he could not engage in such an affair in eighteen eleven captain white now a colonel in the illinois militia sold out his interest in the salt works to three men jonathan taylor of randolph county illinois charles wilkins and james morrison of lexington kentucky from the beginning of eighteen o eight to eighteen eleven leonard white afterwards known as general leonard white seems to have been the government agent he himself later on became interested in salt making in the summer of eighteen eleven colonel isaac white was in vincennes and was initiated into the masonic lodge at that place and on september nineteenth eighteen eleven he was raised to the sublime degree of master mason colonel joe davies of kentucky who was in vincennes at the same time acted as worshipful master Colonel Davies was in Vincennes in response to an invitation from Governor Harrison preparatory to an attack upon the Indians. On November 7, 1811, Colonel Davies and Colonel White fell side by side in the Battle of Tippecanoe. On February 12, 1812, Congress created the Shawnee Town Land District. Thomas Slough was appointed register and john caldwell was made receiver in this same act a provision authorized the president to reserve 
not less than one township of the land around the salt works from sale leonard white willis hargrave and philip trammell were made a commission to select the lands which should be reserved as the saline reservation they performed their duty and set aside ninety six thousand seven hundred sixty six point seven nine acres this was something over four townships this was and is yet called the reservation about the same time mr slew notified the general land office that there were saline indications in other localities in southern illinois and he was accordingly authorized to make reservations adjacent to such springs or licks mr slew made a tour of inspection and as a result about eighty four thousand acres additional were reserved for saline purposes from eighteen o seven to the admission of illinois august twenty sixth eighteen eighteen the entire rental accruing to the united states from the salines on the saline river was a hundred and fifty eight thousand three hundred and ninety four bushels and the total cash turned into the treasury for the same time was twenty eight thousand one hundred sixty point twenty five dollars ohio turned in two hundred and forty dollars in the same time while indiana kentucky and missouri made no returns in eighteen eighteen april eighteenth an enabling act was passed by which illinois was permitted to make a constitution and apply for admission into the union the act contains seven sections the sixth section has four parts part two reads as follows all salt springs within such state and the land reserved for the use of the same shall be granted to the said state for the use of said state and the same to be used under such terms and conditions and regulations as the legislature of the said state shall direct provided the legislature shall never sell nor lease the same for a longer period than ten years at any one time in pursuance of this act the constitutional convention met at kaskaskia in the summer of eighteen eighteen and made a constitution in that constitution are some provisions that used to be a great mystery to me act six deals with the question of slavery section two of the sixth article reads as follows no person bound to labor in any state shall be hired to labor in this state except within the tract reserved for the salt works near shawnee town nor even at that place for a longer period than one year at any one time nor shall it be allowed there after the year eighteen twenty five any violation of this article shall affect the emancipation of such person from his obligation of service the second section of the sixth article provides that all indentures entered into without fraud or collusion prior to the making of the constitution according to the laws of illinois territory shall be held as valid and the person so indented must be held to a fulfillment of the agreement in the contract section one provides that no person could be held to service under an indenture hereafter to be made unless the person was in a state of freedom at the time of making his contract and indentures made by negroes and mulattoes are not valid for a longer time than one year this sixth article deals almost wholly with conditions at the salt works on the saline river at the time the constitution was made congress as well as the territorial legislature of the northwest territory was memorialized time and again for some relief from the sixth article of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven 
as soon as indiana territory passed into the second grade of political organization the legislature passed a law permitting the bringing into the territory of negroes and mulattoes who were slaves in other states the law which regulated the bringing in of the slaves while illinois was a territory was passed by the legislature of indiana in 1805 it provided one that slaves over 15 years of age might be brought in from slave states and within 30 days the owner might enter into an agreement with the said slave by which the slave agreed to work in illinois for a stated time for a consideration two if within the 30 days the slave refused to enter into such an agreement his master had 30 days in which to return him to a slave state this law was applicable in any part of the indiana territory but it was especially advantageous to the lessees of the salt works on saline river mr sellers says in the article in the popular science monthly that the nigger well or salt works was worked almost wholly by negro slaves the reverend samuel westbrook now ninety-five years of age told me he came to johnson county in eighteen twelve and from there finally to equality in eighteen twenty six at that time the wells about the half moon lick were vigorously operated i was very particular to ask him about the use of slave labor and he seemed to think there were a great many negroes and mulattoes at work in the various forms of industry but he seemed to think that most of the colored people were free at that time in my search for information relative to the use of slave labor in the salt works i was directed to a colored family seven miles northwest from equality i found the man of the house mr george elliott about fifty years old while an unmarried sister was sixty-two years old i found these colored people very intelligent and quite prosperous farmers when i made my mission known mr elliott said his sister would provide me with all their old papers his sister brought out a large roll of papers that belonged to their father from these two colored people and the papers i secured the following facts their father cornelius elliott was born a slave in seventeen ninety one his master was john elliott of maury county tennessee cornelius had evidently been a laborer in the salt works on the saline river from the time he was old and large enough to be of service in eighteen nineteen timothy gard one of the leases of the salt works seems to have gone into tennessee and bought this slave cornelius of john elliott he brought the negro to the half moon lick and set him to work cornelius was a cooper and barrels were in great demand in eighteen twenty one timothy gard had it in his heart to set cornelius free it appears that cornelius had earned one thousand dollars in the three years either mr gard had received directly the profit of the negro's labor and counted it worth one thousand dollars or else the slave had been permitted to lay by his earnings at any rate i read an indenture on parchment which was written in timothy gard's handwriting in which he says that in consideration of one thousand dollars cash in hand he gives cornelius his freedom the document is signed by timothy gard and sworn to before john marshall a justice of the peace following which is a certificate by joseph m street who was clerk of the court to the effect that john marshall was a justice of the peace within a few years after cornelius had purchased his own freedom he bought the freedom of his mother and three brothers for one of his brothers he paid the sum of five hundred and fifty dollars and i read the manumission papers in eighteen twenty eight cornelius married a free negress from kentucky 
he then bought eighty acres of land and commenced farming he afterwards bought more land and at the time of his death he owned three hundred and sixty acres of good farming land six or seven miles northwest of equality this story of cornelius elliot is probably only one of scores of similar stories which may be truthfully told of the period of industrial service in the salt works in gallatin county in eighteen eighteen when illinois became a state the salt springs wells and licks with the lands adjacent became the property of the state of illinois at this time there were in existence five distinct leases of salt wells and springs from the united states to individuals the leases had been made by ninian edwards representing the government and all bore date of eighteen seventeen one was with willis hargrave and meredith fisher a second was with jonathan taylor a third with george robinson a fourth was with james ratcliffe a fifth with timothy guard the benefit of the unexpired leases from august twenty sixth eighteen eighteen to june nineteenth eighteen twenty fell to the state of illinois the legislature which met at kaskaskia in the winter of eighteen 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 nineteen authorized the governor of the state to continue these leases with the above named gentlemen the governor was also authorized to lease the big muddy saline for a term of ten years this saline was in jackson county three miles west of the present city of murfreesboro this saline had been leased to conrad will march twenty fifth eighteen fifteen for three years brownsville was made the county seat of jackson county in eighteen sixteen the salt wells were near the town one a half mile above and one a mile below or down the river from the town mr will came to kaskaskia from pennsylvania about eighteen eleven he bought a drove of cattle and took them back to pennsylvania he must have returned shortly after this for he seems to have been in kaskaskia some time previous to his leasing the wells in eighteen fifteen it is more than probable that either mr will or someone else was working the wells on big muddy prior to eighteen fifteen at least mr will returned to pennsylvania the second time it seems after kettles to make salt these kettles mr will probably brought down the ohio up the mississippi and then up the big muddy on keelboats he brought his family to brownsville about eighteen fourteen or eighteen fifteen they lived at first in a double log house which is said to have stood for many years help was scarce in jackson county in eighteen fifteen so mr will is said to have gone into kentucky and brought slaves to his salt works conrad will was a doctor and his granddaughter now living in carbondale has some of his books he made salt and ran a tan yard he served in the constitutional convention of eighteen eighteen and in several of the early legislatures he had one granddaughter who was born in eighteen twenty eight several years before mr will's death in eighteen twenty four the legislature authorized the governor to lease the big muddy saline to james pierce in eighteen twenty seven mr pierce not having accomplished much in his salt making the legislature relieved him of his obligation relative to the salt works in eighteen thirty four the wells were leased to conrad will again till eighteen forty at this time eighteen forty the lands should be sold there is no record of any income to the general government or to the state from the big muddy saline at this place as i have noted there were two wells about a mile apart the machinery consisted of a row or double row of kettles set over an open ditch the sides of this ditch were lined with cut sandstone at one end of the row of kettles the fires were kept going and at the other end of the row was a smokestack. the 
The kettles were very large, holding about 100 gallons each. To within the past 10 years, the old furnaces were quite undisturbed, but of late the rocks have all been taken out to make foundations. The old kettles are scattered over the neighborhood and are used chiefly for scalding the hogs at butchering time. One of the wells had a copper pipe running down into the earth through which the water flowed out at the top. A few years ago an enterprising citizen hitched his team to the pipe and twisted it off several feet below the surface. Water still flows out at that point. There was, in the first part of the last century, a saline in Monroe County, nine miles due west of the present city of Waterloo. It was owned and worked by General Edgar. The Honorable A. C. Bollinger of Waterloo took the pains to secure some facts about this saline, but he was unable to secure any information of value. Colonel William R. Morrison was unable to furnish anything definite, but suggested that Dr. Lewis James of Old Mines, Missouri, might be able to give some valuable facts concerning this saline. But a letter to the doctor failed to bring a response. In 1826, the United States Senate asked the Secretary of the Treasury for a complete report of all incomes from the salines and also a description of all reservations. In this report from the Secretary of the Treasury, no mention is made of salines in Monroe, Madison, or Bond counties. However, from reliable sources, we know that Judge Biggs made salt in Madison on Silver Creek and in Bond on Shoal Creek. And from an act of the legislature in 1827, it appears that Stephen Galliard and Samuel Montgomery were leasees of a saline on Shoal Creek in Bond County. By act of the legislature, January 23, 1833, the governor was authorized to lease the salines in Bond County or to appoint an agent to take charge of them. The wells were on Section 32 in Township 6, Range 4. One section was reserved from sale. The first well was just at the edge of the water of Shoal Creek. The settlers dug a second well on higher ground and drew the water with ordinary water buckets. The boiling was done in kettles, and it is said there were as many as 90 of them. Many of the kettles are to be found in the locality. Besides Montgomery and Galliard above referred to, James Coyle, Spencer, John Lee, and other made salt here. James Coyle settled near the wells in 1817. On April 4, 1822, a son, Jeremiah Coyle, was born, and he still lives on the old homestead. I am indebted to the Reverend Thomas W. Hines for the facts about the Shoal Creek saline. In the early days of salt making on the Saline River, wood only was used for fuel. The water was boiled in large cast iron kettles holding from 60 to 100 gallons. They were placed in rows and one furnace would sometimes have from 20 to 30 kettles. At first the furnace was close to the well or spring. Timber was plentiful and it was not difficult to keep the furnace supplied with fuel. As time went on, the process became more systematic and the works grew. More timber was needed to make more salt. The item of hauling wood three or four miles became a serious one. In those days, there were professional axemen, expert teamsters, and skilled firemen. It was a busy scene. Twenty or thirty axemen in the timber, eight or ten, four or six mule teams on the roads from the timber to the furnaces, six or eight regular firemen, kettle hands, coopers, salt packers, salesmen, timekeepers, boarding house keepers, freighters, hoop pole merchants, and hangers on by the score. The water was put in fresh at the fire end of the row 
and moved from kettle to kettle back toward the chimney where there was a large flat stirring off pan attached to this pan was a large draining board the salt was scraped up to one side of the pan and shoveled up on this board the water drained back into the pan and the salt became dry it was then taken to the salt shed where it was packed in barrels and was then ready for the market when the timber had been used up back three or four miles then they moved the works to the fuel the water must now be gotten to the furnaces this to modern engineers would be a simple problem but to our friends of one hundred years ago it was not so simple a task the plan required a long tedious preparation large straight trees from sixteen to twenty feet long in body were cut they must be at least ten inches in diameter at the small end this would make them fourteen to sixteen inches in diameter at the large end with a four inch auger a hole was bored lengthwise through this log the opening in the large end was seamed to about six inches in diameter while the small end was trimmed down to about six inches from outside to outside strong iron bands were then put on the large end and the small end of another log was forced into the large end of the first log the second log was driven into the first with a sort of battering ram such as we have used to bombard the large hickory trees to knock off nuts in the fall of the year these wooden pipes were laid from the spring or well to the furnace which was often three to five miles away the pipe lines are said to have been always straight and went over hills and across creeks however the country is comparatively level when the pipes crossed the creeks they weighted the pipes to the bottom of the stream with large castings in the general form of a horseshoe these were straddled over the logs and are said to have weighed two hundred and fifty to three hundred pounds all the pipes made prior to 1850 were made by hand but about 1850 or probably a little later they were bored by horsepower as said before the pipe line took a straight line from the well to the furnace at the well a pump or rather an elevator was rigged up a continuous belt with flat buckets riveted to it this crude elevator raised the water ten twenty or thirty feet as needed and thence it flowed down an upright pipe which connected at the bottom with the regular pipeline i was not able to determine whether or not there were relay stations but i am inclined to think there were the cisterns where these elevators were located were called heisting cisterns the fact that this piping system was in use in an early day has led to some errors with regard to wells some people living in those regions have thought there was a well wherever there was a furnace and the old furnaces are thick all over the country this is not the case there were few wells but the piping system carried the water in all directions the two chief places where wells were sunk were at the nigger spring and at half moon lick it has been estimated that one hundred miles of pipe was laid from eighteen hundred to eighteen seventy three the first wells were probably square and were twenty feet in diameter and about sixty feet deep they were walled up with logs all the old wells as they appear today are circular and are about twenty to twenty-five feet in diameter and from four to ten feet deep with sloping sides the water rose in these wells to within a few feet of the top of the ground in what may be called the middle period of salt making pipes were sunk in the bottom of these wells and a stronger brine secured timothy gard who was connected with salt making as early as eighteen sixteen and as late as 1830 or later dug a deep well near the half moon lick perhaps as late as 1825 
the well was dug down some sixty feet and walled up and then a boring was made in the bottom of this well a very fine quality of brine was thus secured and guard's well is a very noted place though few could point out the exact spot a large tree is growing on the inner margin of this well its banks are grassy and water stands in it some six feet below the surface of the ground this well was used till about 1854 about this time a company was formed consisting of stephen r rowan andrew mcallen chalen guard abner flanders broughton temple and joseph j castle they made preparation to manufacture salt on a more extensive scale than ever before they sunk another deep well at great expense and expended so much money that the company broke up and castle and temple eventually became the owners of the grounds and improvements these two men proceeded to complete the preparations for the manufacture of salt large boilers engines and pumps were installed large boiler iron evaporating pans were placed over the furnaces instead of the kettles these pans were from twelve to twenty feet wide and extended from the grates to the smokestack a distance of sixty or seventy feet there were three such rows of pans all connected with the same smokestack the old pans are lying there now in the weeds and brush i calculated their area and found they covered about three thousand square feet the pans were from ten to twelve inches deep coal had been discovered in a nearby hill and it was substituted for wood a tramway was built from the coal mine to the furnaces the water or brine was pumped from the deep wells to the top of the thorn house this thorn house was a frame structure resembling in general appearance the false work used in constructing a bridge across a small river it was twenty or thirty feet wide at the bottom and extended sixty feet high narrowing toward the top this would be the end view it extended some one hundred fifty or one hundred seventy five feet in length there were quite a number of cross beams ties and braces and the whole inner space was filled with bundles of thorn bushes these bundles of thorn bushes were carefully packed in the framework in such a way that all space was completely filled with them these thorn bushes were found in great quantities all about the works on top of this thorn house running its entire length was a trough full of small holes the brine was pumped into this trough and allowed to flow gently to the other end and if it did not trickle through the holes on the first trip it was guided into another trough and caused to flow down it till all had passed through the openings in the bottom of the trough this brine now trickled through the thorn faggots to the bottom of the structure where it was caught in a large trench and conveyed to a large retaining basin this thorn house was a great mystery to the infrequent visitors to the salt works there are two explanations of its office in salt making one that the brine in passing from the top of the structure to the bottom lost by evaporation forty per cent of the water this was a great saving of fuel and labor in the boiling process another explanation of its use was this in evaporating the brine by boiling the water there were deposits of some substance like gypsum at the bottom of the pan which adhered to the bottoms of the pans and if not often removed would prevent the passage of the heat from the fire to the water and thus the pans would be burned now the thorn bushes were supposed to have the power to crystallize this foreign matter and thus purify the brine this plant was owned and operated by temple and castle from about eighteen fifty four to eighteen seventy three they are said to have made five hundred bushels of salt every twenty-four hours in about eighteen seventy three temple and castle 
constructed a very complete plant a mile away at the coal mine thinking it cheaper to move the water to the coal than the coal to the water the plant was an expensive one and when everything was nearly ready for work hard times came on salt became cheap and the new works were never put into operation in course of time the machinery was removed and little is left to mark the new plant on december eighteenth nineteen o three i visited this region i spent four days in gathering up the facts concerning this great industry of a former age it was a pleasant task mr a d blankenship a former student in the normal was kind enough to furnish me a conveyance and accompany me in my investigations on reaching equality i was fortunate to make the acquaintance of messrs moore druggists who are very much interested in preserving the story of early days about their town mr harry moore accompanied me to the old works the ground is quite level and subject to overflow the day was an ideal spring day and as i stood on the spot where for three-fourths of a century a great industry flourished i had a strange feeling it was deathly still there were no noises no bird songs no cattle no life a mile away we could hear the noise of the village a passing train and the noise about the coal mine and coke ovens we soon came to the cinder roads and then we knew we were near the furnaces now and then we passed an old well we had a camera and we took views of wells pans thorn bushes etc we found the old furnaces the outlines of the old pans are still to be seen one old pan is quite well preserved but it will soon be moulded back to earth whence it came we found the old retaining cistern and found the location of the old residence of temple and castle about a quarter of a mile away we visited the noted half moon lick this is some one half quarter long and half quarter wide at the widest part it is about twenty or twenty five feet deep and is destitute of any growth except some willows and tufts of grass this lick is supposed to have been the resort of wild animals for centuries past the teeth and bones of mastodons have been found here we got a fairly good view of this lick the afternoon i spent with mr mcavoy a very intelligent and courteous old gentleman who came to equality about eighteen fifty five mr mcavoy is a friend of mr temple and is in possession of much valuable information which he has gathered in the last half century the second day i visited the nigger well four miles below equality and across the river from the town there was a downpour of rain this day which prevented me from making a close study of this region however i was able to find the exact spot the nigger spring which was salt and is the one evidently just used the sulphur spring which i found very strong and was evidently formerly in use for the old timbers are still to be seen embedded in the mud and the fresh water spring not far away these are all described by colonel sellers as early as eighteen fifty four just to the right as you go down the river towards the southeast is a high range of hills and at the nigger well the bluffs come close to the river and it is just up on these bluffs where colonel sellers used to find the indian graves and evidences of a village a few yards below the springs i found a native to the manor born he had lived in that immediate vicinity for fifty years and seemed a little surprised to think anyone would attach any importance to these old salt springs he told me that in a little bottom field just in front of his house and lying just below the springs that he had ploughed up bushels of broken pottery and that the whole field seemed to be one big furnace i asked him if any salt had been made there within the last fifty years 
and he said that everything looked just as it did fifty years ago i examined carefully the trees and i am very sure there are many of them three feet in diameter and yet colonel sellers affirms that in an early day every stick of timber was cut off for fuel i learned from the native above referred to that there was an old pipeline running from the springs near to an old furnace down the creek but across from his house and he said he was sure the old kettles were there yet but said they were covered up in the dirt but he was sure they could be found he said further that another line of pipe led to a furnace further down the river this line may have led to weeds works which were one half mile below the island ripple i visited shawnee town and spent considerable time with mr charles carroll whom i found to be a very pleasant gentleman he is probably the best informed man in shawnee town on early gallatin county history i spent some time in the recorder's office verifying some facts which i had gathered elsewhere incidentally i took one occasion to visit the old flag said to have been carried in the revolutionary war by general pavey i also viewed for a few moments the old brick house in which general lafayette was entertained this is called the rollins house finally i viewed with no little interest the humble home in which illinois greatest soldier and our honored guest today were married general and mrs juno a logan the third day in company with mr mcavoy mr mcintyre mr bunker and mr smith i visited again the old salt works on the outskirts of equality the second visit was very profitable for mr mcintyre was from a boy an employee about the works and most of the time in the capacity of cooper mr mcintyre knew every foot of the ground and with his help i drew a map locating every important place of interest about the grounds on this day in company with dr gordon and mr mcavoy i called to see uncle peter white colored now seventy years old uncle pete was brought up in the immediate vicinity of the salt works when he was ten years old he and three other children were kidnapped and taken into arkansas and sold he was afterwards rescued by watt white uncle peter's memory is good and i gathered some valuable information from him on the fourth day i visited the elliott family previously referred to and also the reverend samuel westbrook now living in el dorado mr westbrook was born in eighteen o nine he came to johnson county in eighteen twelve and in eighteen twenty six he came to equality and began laboring in various capacities in the salt-making business he was among other things a teamster he had lived in the immediate vicinity of the salt works for the past seventy-eight years and has a very vivid picture of most of the incidents which occurred within that period the men and women who have lived in this region from a very early day are very few and their ranks are thinning every day in a few years there will be none living whose lives cover the period of salt making and so far as i have been able to find out little if anything has ever been written and printed of this great industry of southern illinois end of the salines of southern illinois by george w smith from the transactions of the illinois state historical society 1904 Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. When the Dew Falls From the book Water Wonders Every Child Should Know Little Studies of Dew, Frost, Snow, Ice, and Rain by Jean M. Thompson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Everything shone with the dewdrops that sparkled and trembling lay, scattered to left and to right, and the webs of the spiders were hung thickly with pearls and diamonds, light in the wind they swung. 
one of the most interesting and instructive phenomena in the lessons of nature is the falling of the dew a seeming miracle which begins with the setting of the sun and goes on mysteriously collecting and distributing its countless exquisite water jewels all through the long stillness of the night only to be dispelled again by the heat of the rising sun we are more or less familiar through casual observation with the varied beauties of the dew a walk in the country or park in the early midsummer morning just after the sun has risen if possible will enable you fully to appreciate its charms especially if the dew fall during the preceding night has been a copious one every bit of plant life and vegetation will sparkle and twinkle in the early sunshine hung and embellished with millions of glittering jewels the very smallest grass blade you will discover has not been neglected by the dew fairy and even the delicate gossamer like spider's web swung from twig to twig or caught among the grasses is dew laden and an object of beauty well worthy of consideration happy indeed are you if you have enjoyed a stroll in an old-fashioned country flower garden in the early morning no need to dwell upon its charms if you have enjoyed that pleasure for you will long remember the refreshment and peace which came to you with the close companionship of the great pink damask roses their petals still heavy with the night dews the tall sentinel-like lilies cool and fragrant their cups filled with dewy nectar which great blundering bees were eagerly plundering clean-smelling flocks waist-high each velvet cluster moist and bent with its weight of dew then the beds of gray green mignonette and the best of all down in an out-of-the-way corner a tangle of unobtrusive old-fashioned pinks where you knelt and buried your face for a moment to inhale their spicy fragrance and found them doubly sweet and satisfying after their drenching dew bath while the beds of simples and humbler things the sage and wormwood with their silvery leaves heavy with dew exhaled a pungent aromatic odor as you brushed them in passing for the dew had refreshed them and enhanced their dormant spiciness tenfold the phenomenon of the dew is simply explained and well worthy of a short study as it is really a most important factor in nature's laws simply explained the dew is really an actual deposit of water from the atmosphere upon the surface of the earth and is formed when the earth is sufficiently cooled during the night by radiation upon a pleasant day during summer especially if the sun shines brightly much aqueous vapor or mist is held suspended in the air and if the temperature at sunset falls below the dew point that vapor can no longer be retained in suspension in the air and falls to the earth the dew is the vapor of the air sometimes it can readily be seen falling in a fine mist resembling rain it is the humidity of the air deposited upon all surfaces of the earth with which it comes in contact when the temperature falls below the dew point or thirty two degrees the dew then becomes converted into frost and we have a deposit of hoar frost instead of the dew it has been remarked that horizontal and flat surfaces exposed to the dew receive a greater deposit than sheltered or oblique surfaces dew has frequently been quoted as a shower from heaven but this is not literally correct true it appears rather mysteriously from a clear sky and upon a still cloudless night covers thickly every blade of grass and plant life with seeming raindrops and that frequently where rain clouds rarely appear and the rain seldom falls in such climates where a rainfall is rare it is certainly a most beneficial and wise provision 
for it gathers upon all herbage and vegetation in sparkling refreshing profusion while it avoids instinctively all barren rocky formations and all things which could not be benefited by its grateful cooling moisture also in cold damp climates where the air is constantly saturated with moisture and where an additional amount is not required the gathering clouds and the dampness of the chilly atmosphere prevent a radiation of heat from the earth and the dew never falls in such climates there are three requisites which appear to be essential for the formation of the dew first that the air should be moist second that the surface upon which it falls shall be cold and third that the sky be clear of course the atmosphere always contains a greater amount of moisture after a rainfall when the air has been greatly cooled evaporation is then continually going on among all objects lying near the surface of the earth blades of grass and all plants near the ground gradually cool and assume a lower temperature after sunset they are preparing for the fall of the dew it has been remarked that certain plants possess greater powers of radiating heat and of expelling moisture through evaporative process than others upon such plants the dew deposit is always more profuse while those plants possessing little powers of radiation and evaporation collect little dew there are very many plants whose leaves are downy with a thick growth of tiny vegetable hairs the mullen leaf is a good example its thick velvety leaves are thickly covered with this growth of vegetable down and present a velvety surface these leaves always collect a fine display of dew jewels one has been caught by the camera perched upon the down of a mullen leaf as shown in the photographic illustration during still nights in early spring and fall when there are no disturbing winds the water molecules or dew drops in countless numbers form one upon another all night long and settle upon blades of grass and all growing plants and in the morning sunshine dance and sparkle in strings of scintillating diamonds from every pasture and hedgerow the sharp pointed grasses collect the dew very copiously and in a most interesting manner dewdrops formed upon the grass blades it will be observed are arranged in a truly wonderful symmetrical fashion and one marvels at the orderly arrangement frequently one large dewdrop clear as a diamond is deposited upon the very tip of the little grass blade sometimes two and even three large drops are held in suspension thus while upon the extreme sharp edge of one or both sides of the blade a collection of small bead-like drops cling in orderly precise fashion strung from tip to root of the grass blade a broken or blunted blade of grass collects no dew or very little when the large dewdrop perched upon the tip of the grass blade decides to fall it descends rather slowly at first following the extreme edge of the blade in its course and thus meets and collects all the other dewdrops which it encounters strung along the edge of the blade until forming at last one heavy drop it suddenly falls to earth where it is instantly absorbed and goes to give life and strength to the very roots of the plant cobwebs attract the dew in a rather singular manner it is yet to be discovered why the dewdrops form only upon the horizontal threads of a spider's web while the vertical threads though smaller collect no dew deposit this curious fact is well shown in the photograph of the entire spider's web also in the section of a web showing the dew deposit in detail wonderfully beautiful are these dew-laden webs it will be observed that each drop is similar in size 
and closely resembles several strings of well-matched pearls, although in the sunshine they appear as clear flashing diamonds. Certain leaves collect the dewdrops in a novel manner, notably the strawberry leaf and similar plants having serrate edges. The strawberry leaf, besides being plentifully decorated upon its surface with water beads, holds in each tiny serration about its edge a large, clear, sparkling dewdrop, which gives the leaf a wonderful jeweled effect. We are all familiar with the so-called sweating of a glass or pitcher or a metal pipe containing cold water. This is another phase of the dew and may be observed in the daytime. A cool night in spring or autumn, after a hot day, we usually receive a more copious fall of dew, which gradually increases as the night becomes cooler. Should clouds gather, the precipitation of the dew at once ceases. Wherever a bush or bit of vegetation overhangs a spot, it has a similar effect to that of a cloud, and the dew does not collect at all, or not as copiously in that spot. In the tropics, and in certain countries where there are no rain clouds, where they rarely have rain for many months at a time, the dewfall is so heavy that it quite supplies the lack of rainfall. If it were not for this providential visitation of the dew, all vegetable life must certainly perish, scorched and withered by the torrid heat. In the east, in the region of Palestine, the dew frequently is so heavy that it closely resembles rain. Upon the great burning deserts alone, the dew never falls, for the moment the dew vapors or molecules encounter the scorching breath which arises from the face of these barren seas of sand, they evaporate and are redissolved, dissipated, and consumed by the heat. So it will be seen that the fixed molecules which compose vegetation alone have the power to attract and arrest the water molecules of the air with which they come in contact and thus form in combination the dew. When the temperature is below 32 degrees, the tiny particles which go to form the dew become hoar frost. It is often a great value to the farmer or vegetable grower to be able to know just the temperature of the dew point because if he discovers it in time he is enabled to save his garden from a sudden blighting visitation of the frost another interesting fact and one which is known to few of us but which may readily be seen if we take time to study the dew drop minutely is that each tiny drop of dew is in itself a miniature mirror for upon its clear crystal-like surface it holds and faithfully portrays upon its rounded form the image of any nearby object. The picture is, of course, naturally inverted. But you will find it, a bit of blue sky holding a scrap of fleecy cloud or a pygmy forest of trees caught and mirrored in the dewdrop. Often sleeping and dormant insects, when caught out in the open during the night, receive a copious deposit of dew. The caterpillar, shown in the photograph, was a good subject, and quite a collection of dew was deposited upon his furry coat. Nature in all her moods, and they are many, is always entertaining and instructive, and perhaps one of her greatest marvels is that which takes place in the silence of the brooding night, the falling of the gentle dew. End of When the Dew Falls From the book Water Wonders Every Child Should Know Little Studies of Dew, Frost, Snow, Ice, and Rain by Jean M. Thompson Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson